let's talk about the literature for this week. Um, by and large, the reading that you're doing this week is a reaction to the distorted representations of African Americans that existed in the aftermath of the Civil War and during the Reconstruction and post-Reconstruction period. Um, we're going to start off the week with some Booker T. Washington. Um, Booker T. Washington is an interesting figure. From Washington, we get an autobiography that counters the narrative of African Americans as a dangerous and problematic aftermath of the blight of slavery. Nowadays, people tend to see Washington as a person who gave up the dignity of African Americans in exchange for mere material security. But if we read him in a more historically contextualized way, I think we can make more generous judgments about some of what he wrote and, and some of what he did. Washington was well aware of threats to African American dignity and life uh, in light of post-reconstruction. And he is in fact a bridge figure who tried to carve out a path for African Americans that could take them through the aftermath of slavery and the, the dangers, the very real threats that they faced as a result of um, some of the things that were going on during post-Reconstruction. He, he used his uh, life story, which we'll read a little bit of this week, to really make the argument that white Americans in the aftermath of slavery and Reconstruction really didn't need to fear black anger or black retribution over some of the depredations of slavery, number one. But the other stronger argument that's posed by his life story is that in fact African Americans are contributing to a long-standing tradition of success through hard work. It's that narrative of upward mobility that goes back all the way to Benjamin Franklin. So in telling his life story, he writes African Americans into that tradition of success through hard work. And, and that would have been a huge intervention in the way people saw African Americans. People frequently saw African Americans as feckless, lazy kinds of people who were straight off the pages of you know, the, some of the minstrel stories that we talked about earlier this semester. He's saying that here's a life where none of that obtains. In his Atlanta Compromise speech, he actually accepts the premise that African Americans would have to serve an apprenticeship of sorts as workers and contributors to the American economy, free contributors to the American economy before they could gain full citizenship. Although this compromise really caused other African American leaders, including uh, W.B. Du Bois, uh, if you have the chance to take a look at uh, a Booker T. Washington and others that's included in Du Bois's Souls of Black Folk, it, it caused them to call him out for moral cowardice because what they wanted was full and absolute rights as citizens, as equal citizens in the American Republic. Um, Booker T. Washington said what he needed to say in order to tickle the ears of his donors. And some of the work that he did uh, as a part of the Atlanta Compromise really helped him to fund um, educational institutions like Tuskegee, which he was instrumental in. And the people who went through those institutions had a huge positive impact on African American life. Um, so there is, you, you kind of have to balance some of what he was saying with the conditions under which he was saying it. Then we're reading uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. We're only reading a small chunk of his master work the Souls of Black Folk, um, in which he declares that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, therefore making the struggles of African Americans central to all of the 20th century. So he kind of ushers us into that new century. Um, du Bois was trying to carve out a slightly different path by arguing that African Americans had always been contributors to the American project both in terms of their contributions to Amer American spirituality in the form of the Negro spirituals, in terms of their blood, they laid down their lives as uh, soldiers, enslaved people, and also in terms of what he calls toil. Um, African American labor is in many ways responsible for the success of the US during the, the 19th century. So Du Bois says, we've already put it in, so we should definitely have a role to play in American life. We should be uh, central, not peripheral, to the American project. Du Bois is responsible for a really important concept that I want you to be familiar with. It is called double consciousness. He defines double consciousness thus. This is on page 689 of your book. He says, after the Egyptian and Indian, the Greek and the Roman, the Tuatan and the Mongolian, the Negro is a sort of seventh son, born with a veil and gifted with second sight in this American world a world which yields him no true self-consciousness, but only lets him see himself through the revelations of the other world. 
It is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body, whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. So he figures African Americans who have a particular insight into the Western world because they are both African and American because they're able to see things from a black perspective, a black African influence perspective, but also from the perspective of white Euro-Americans. He says this is heroic, that despite the fact that African Americans have to see themselves in the world in these two ways, what they have managed to accomplish despite that. So he does a lot of intervention in the way African Americans are represented by saying that we are in fact heroic. Imagine if we didn't have to expend our energy in these two aims. So that's double consciousness. And so double consciousness becomes a really important way of representing the African American experience in the Western and American world. You are in fact this week reading a poem by Paul Lawrence Dunbar called We Wear the Mask, in which he, he talks about the grave struggle, the, the grave existential struggle that African Americans feel as they experience double consciousness. So keep an eye out for that particular way of thinking about African-American consciousness throughout the rest of the semester. Then we have Anna Julia Cooper. I would argue that Anna Julia Cooper is one of the foremothers of black womanism. Um, womanism is really a species of feminism that really focuses on the whole of, of the African-American community, that um, the well-being and wholeness of African-American women is in fact central to the wellness and whole being of the entire African American community. So she makes that strong argument. By the time we get to the reconstruction, post reconstruction period, African American women are already well underway in terms of being represented in the very damaging and negative ways that Hortense Spillers talked about in her seminal essay that we read earlier this semester. Um, so one of the things that Anna Julia Cooper does is to go in and say, look, we have to stop that. If our race as a whole is going to succeed and pull itself up by its bootstraps, the place to focus is on women because women have a powerful role in their communities, in their families, and in the, in the culture and value of the African American community. So she moves women to the to the center stage. Um, I'm only having you read a brief part of that. I think it really gets to the heart um, of, of the point that she's trying to make, that women are valuable. In the arc of this course, Anna Julia Cooper really represents that very strong voice of black middle class women who were heavily engaged in what's called racial uplift. They expended a lot of energy in social programs, economic programs, and educational programs in order to uplift the race. These women were largely middle class or affluent. They were part of that black growing middle class and so she really represents that voice. Finally, this week we are reading some work by Charles Chestnut. Um, Chestnut's literature is really interesting. Um, we're reading one of his short stories, The Goofert Grapevine. And The Goofert Grapevine is, again, what I'll call a bridge text. It straddles um, some of the African-American orature and folklore that we talked about earlier this semester, uh, and what African-American literature was becoming by the time we get to the post-Reconstruction period. Um, he's writing in the face of what had become very popular during this period, plantation literature, which had a very nostalgic take on uh, the plantation south. Um, it's, it's the sweet tea and magnolias that we talked about earlier this semester. And so the Goober Grapevine has all the hallmarks of plantation literature. It's set on a plantation. Um, there's dialect there. Um, and there's an enslaved narrator who, who again speaks using African American dialect. But it radically departs from the, the plantation literature that would have been popular during the day by representing the plantation as being in ruins. It's a plantation that's been subject to the historical processes that happened as a result of the Civil War and Reconstruction. And second of all, and most importantly, by having the narrator make an economic claim uh, on the plantation um, as a result of his knowledge of the history of slavery and as a result of his, his continued placement on the plantation. So that's a, a huge and, and radical kind of thing to say that African Americans had the right to some kind of reparations or economic stake in the South because they had already put in the labor. So that narrator is actually 
making the, the case for that. So you just want to pay attention to the historical context there and the description of the, the plantation being in ruins, okay? So that's it. Um, please make sure you skim that period introduction. I'm not asking you to read it deeply, but I am asking you to skim it just to make sure you get a good sense of the historical context of the period because lots of important historical things are happening that you need to understand in order to understand where the writers are coming from. And there will be no quiz this week, um, but you are responsible for the terms covered in this video and the materials for this week. They will be on the quiz for next week, okay? I hope you have a great week. Bye-bye.